I never heard man. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that but Mark thank you for coming on uh, it's really appreciated I know that you're a busy busy guy you've got <laughs> back, several bands you've got family you've got kids so it is appreciated that you make the time to come on so thank you for coming on it's good to see you again after all these years to, uh, maybe people don't know but we've known each other for a very long time uh, 20, maybe 24 years nearly a quarter yeah. of a century what I like to do normally, Mark, I, I normally ask people that come on, how did we first meet? So do okay. you remember where it was and how did we first meet? Yeah, of course. Like, we were at Stowe College together. Uh, and, yeah, we were in the same class. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just started. It was me, you and uh, Graham Laurie, or Greg Laurie, like, kinda, uh, as we just started hanging out, right? And, um, and it, just from there, that's where it so the relationship and the, the music chat started. Yeah. It's it's weird. So when you think back to that now, mm. it feels like forever ago for me. It just oh. feels like a lifetime ago. And I, I remember it because I think you you and me are the same age. We were both 17, had mm -hmm. just left high school, went to Stowe College for, for music production. And uh, Graham, who I think was maybe a year younger than us, yeah. uh, he started, and I think there was a, a guy called Billy, who you, you, you'll remember Billy. Ah, I still speak to Billy on and off um, a couple of times a year. And I've not seen him for a, a long time. Last time I seen him, I had hair. Let's put it that way. <laughs> wow, a long but, time ago. <laughs> well, both, it was that thing where, if I remember rightly, we, we, we probably just ended up grouping together because we were of the same age. I mean, everybody that was in that class... We were probably pals, but there was a, a group that were maybe, we were 17, they were maybe 23, 24, which there is a bit of an age gap there when you're that age, but yep. we, we, we were all friends, but we had like a wee group and, you know, we would spend, I don't know how many hours we lost downstairs in the Brunswick Cellars. The Brunswick, and I didn't even drink then as well, so, uh, <laughs> so I remember, yeah, we just, because like, we'd have a class at like nine in the morning and then not one till two in the afternoon so we just used to hang out and, and pretty much chat and just it, it was great it was like the, the days where you had nothing really to like worry about <laughs> right? or no, no real life con like no connotations or whatever so just, yeah, uh, good wandering, times. Up and, wandering up and down Sucky Hall Street yeah talking about music in and out of music shop you still had music shop back then yeah, yeah, absolutely in and out of but mm -hmm. um, going right back then Mark so I probably know this, but for anybody that's watching, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Milton, in the north of uh, Glasgow. Uh, yeah. And see, when you were a wee kid, um, were you into music from a very early age, or was music simply back then just maybe some background noise that your parents were playing? Yeah, I mean, a, a wee bit. I wasn't. I didn't start playing till I was like high school, kind of thing. Like now, maybe. Properly set in third year at high school, but so music before that was, but it wasn't simply just a background thing because, like, my mum and dad who were separated, like, you know, they like both households, the music meant so much to them, you know. Like, now my dad's absolutely the biggest music lover, and um, you know, like, just the way he would interact with the song when it was on, like, and my mum as well, like, you know, she just loved music as well, so she still does. Uh, so, yeah, so it was infectious, you know, because it was infecting them. So it definitely wasn't just a background thing, but I hadn't played a note yet or even thought about it, you know. So, but it was there. It's when you, when you, it's funny in retrospect when you look back, maybe it's something similar yourself. Even before you started playing, it was it was it was it was finding you for sure, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Like, I, I prob probably similar to yourself. I didn't give it much thought. I mean, there was always music. It was more so my my dad. My dad really liked his music, and uh, again, if you're on a a car journey somewhere there was always music playing <laughs> you, you didn't really give it much thought until a lot later on that I go back and I, and I remember the song the, the albums and that that he was playing so he was playing it was stuff he grew up on so it was obviously like The Who The Doors The Beatles The Rolling Stones Credence and uh, and you, you remember you remember all these songs because they, these are the songs from your childhood that you grew up on but what sort of music do you remember what your mum and dad were both listening to? Yeah I mean my mum was definitely loved her dance disco stuff like Chic Diana Ross stuff like that so and that definitely found its way into my 
music as well at some point, as, as, you, as you know, but like, my dad was like definitely more eclectic in the sense of, it was the Stones, it was Bob Dylan, but it was Zappa, uh, it was uh, Doors, obviously, like, kind of, it was, it was all those kind of, yes, like, like the prog stuff as well, so like, my, my dad, uh, and all, all, all blues and jazz as well, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a real mix of both worlds. So what, what age were you when you'd, you know, everybody has music, they grow up with music, but there's a certain age that you get to, that you all of a sudden develop your own taste. This is something that you've mm -hmm. discovered yourself rather than it being something that your parents introduced you to. So do you remember what age you were when you kind of discovered your own type of music that you enjoyed? That, that's such a good question. Like, I don't think anyone's ever asked that question before. That's such a great question. <laughs> uh, so, um, I don't know, maybe, like, like I, I always felt like I was playing catch-up with music. So, like, in terms of playing it anyway, but even even listening to it, because even though it was always there, it wasn't until I started playing music where I started going, right, wow, what is music and stuff? So, it was probably uh, late teens before I could definitely say, I, mean, I was still, I mean, I'm still introduced to music, right, but like, Back then, it was like I was a sponge for it. I was like, yeah, what, "What have you got?" and stuff. So, um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose maybe after school college, I went to Strathclyde Uni and get, taking the bus there and like having a, a cassette Walkman. You know, like now that's how long ago that was. And actually, then picking my own music to listen. That was the first time maybe like I, I could like now uh, dictate a, a playlist or whatever. You know, so like can I? So yeah, maybe it was like. 18, 19 before I could definitely say right these are even when I met you you know I definitely had some idea but yeah getting, getting a bit more specific about it and saying it's actually my taste yeah it's probably late, late teens but and it's always changing as well like now I'm still trying to work out what I like when did you when did you get into the piano and, and what got you into it what inspired you yeah. that, like, let's be honest most people you know, there's a million guitarists out there. Guitar, yeah. play guitar. The guitar is probably the most common musical instrument that people have a shot at. What got you into piano instead? The the the, more, the inspiration was laziness because uh, at high school you got like a free half hour period of uh, music, a, a lesson one to one, mm -hmm. and um, and it got you out of maths or English or history. And I was like, I, I saw all these other kids getting taken out. I was like, I'm just signing up for that. So. I just signed up and it was, I think, I mean, the music department I had at my high school was like, it was so like, it was like, I came from a, quite a rough area, so it was really depleted, you know, like the teachers were incredible, but like in terms of like, there was no bands or orchestra stuff, really, uh, so it was basically, they had a couple of instrument pianos and a couple of recorders, so really piano was the only option at that point for me, you know, they didn't have like drums and, and brass and stuff, but like in terms of like, they can just put you on something that didn't cost any money to start your shit off. Was the piano? Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was. So it was. Yeah, it was like first or second year, just taking keyboard lessons, and then I, I quickly got moved to piano with my piano teacher, Mrs. Lee's. Uh, and I, I would say it was only for real, maybe end of second year at high school. I think I think we must have went to similar type schools because <laughs> Aaron, the, there was no school band or any of that nonsense when I was in school you went to school and I, I can remember the music department you, you had I think they must have bought them in bulk but it was those really cheap acoustic guitars mm. with, the, with the plastic strings on them yeah. I'm not kidding I remember one day just sitting in class and you know there's always a, a cycle in, in your class and uh, but they're like a lovable cycle and I can remember this guy, I mean, this guy already, he was like 12 year old, he already had a beard and like was just like crazy. And I can remember him when the teacher went out of the class, he, he got every acoustic guitar and smashed it over the back, over, over his, every single guitar, the back bit was mm -hmm. so in. All your glockenspiels, you know, you didn't have a full set of keys on any of them and they were, you'd be lucky if you got two beaters. Mm -hmm. Just crazy, but you had obviously those keyboards with the bloody demos that folk would yeah. press, to annoy the teacher and stuff. But I mean, I met you when you were seventeen, and mm -hmm. you were already you seemed like an accomplished like <laughs> piano player. Now mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you're thinking back. There was so much more that you've learnt since then. But mm -hmm. I mean, you're capable of playing it. So yeah, did you, did you get lessons at school? Like you'd said, and did, did you just progress from there? Yeah, I mean. 
I, I got that one half hour less than a week from Mrs. Lee's, but again, it was like once I found music or music found me, whatever you want to call it, I just that was it. I was just hooked. So I used to just eat before school, lunchtime, after school. I used to actually skip classes uh, to go up to music to practice because. I'd wake up during the night. I mean, it just really affected me, you know. So, like, you know, as soon as it hit me, it hit me hard, and it's, it's never left. So, like, I had to, and I also felt like I was playing catch up, like, because I felt really old, even though I was like third year at the secondary school, high school. So, but I felt like everyone started piano or guitars, like, when they're seven or eight years old, and I was like nearly fifteen or whatever, fourteen, fifteen. So, I just felt like I was like trying to catch up with everybody. So, I, every second I had I was practicing uh, just bring, not, not, just not even practicing I, I'd even say it was exploring you know like now because I didn't like I had, I had so much to learn and there was and even my piano teacher she was incredible and um, um, and she did amazing to get me where I was but uh, even she would say we just need to kind of like get you going and fast track you in a lot of ways here because it was like that when did you get your I mean you're obviously practicing at school but when mm. did you get your first um, keyboard or was it your parents that bought you it for your Christmas or how did you go about getting your first actual instrument at home? Yeah, well, actually it was my nana and granddad. Um, they bought me this uh, piano. Uh, I, 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 it was like, it was £300, which was a lot of money back then as well for us, you know, like, you know, and I, I saw, I, it was me, I just, I was like, in the evening times, used to get the for sale things. And it was like this this piano, and it was a, a coffee shop in Annie's Land. Um, was selling it, and I, I just arranged it, and I was like, I, I really want this. And, uh, and my nana and granddad just like they went right, we'll get you kind of thing, you know. So like, cause so that that was the real the first time, and I maybe had a little keyboard maybe, but like kinda, it was like there was only a few like it was like forty seven keys. It was plastic. It was like a toy almost, you know. And also, my dad used to take me to the Mitchell Library because he had the piano carrels in there, and they were free. Uh, and then they started charging like two pounds or something, but like it was pretty much free. And uh, so once a week, my dad would take me down there as well. So, but I, I never got my, my piano until maybe just before I started Stowe College as well. So. But they must have seen that that you were it was something that you were passionate about because mm -hmm. similar similar to you, I'd asked for a guitar when I was. 10 I think I was and you know my, my parents didn't play an instrument so you know it was a very it's an expensive thing to buy a guitar and an amplifier yeah. especially if it's, you know having never played it how do we know if he's actually even going to stick this thing out of that so they I think I must have asked for Christmas and they obviously like said no and then a year later I'm still asking right so the, the, the what they'd said was well we'll get you Mm -hmm. My mum's brother, so my uncle, he he played bass guitar, mm -hmm. so he was he lived down in London. So he, back then, you used to get the big music shows, and um, you get all the the different companies come along advertising their gear. And if you went along, you could you could get a good deal, or, right. or something maybe a little bit cheaper. And uh, he, he got us a guitar and amp. And the, the the deal was that I had to go to lessons to learn the basics. And then, but to be honest, I went to lessons, I didn't enjoy them, I did learn the basics, but every time I wasn't in a lesson, I was home, probably similar to yourself, trying to just pick up anything, learn little bits, and you know, so I, w I didn't need to get told to sit and practice the thing, I wanted to yeah. sit and learn it, and that would have been the same with yourself, probably. Uh, uh, absolutely. In fact, I just remember as well, like, uh, see these these defining moments, you know, like, you know, I remember for maybe a Christmas or something, like my nan and grandma, they bought me this, this this DJ set thing, and it was I was so excited for it, and it was broke, and it just it just never worked. But my my nana bought my granddad this little keyboard, so yeah. because it was broke, I just that, I was like, well, that plays music as well. So I think that's how I, I first started, and I used to always I was always there at my nan and granddad's anyway, and um, I would just sit and play that up, up, but it was his keyboard kind of thing, you know. But I'd always just hijack it. So yeah, but like that. So I just remembered that. But um, yeah, exactly. It was just like, like again when I was getting lessons, like I was so like wet by ideas with it all. Like I was, I was giving a sheet of paper. And it was, it was mostly classical to start with as well. Um, so I, I, I've relearned really the piano 
at least three times because then I went when I met people who could play by ear. I was like, I didn't know you could do this. I mean, it was like kind of like you know, like and, and so I had to relearn how to play the piano and do it by ear. And then you can't forget what you've learned as well. So then it becomes this hybrid where you can read music and you can pay, play by ear and. Like, and then you need to prioritise what's what's more suit for you kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been crazy. But like, yeah, every second uh, of every day, it's always to do music. And, and to be honest, it still is. So you're uh, so you're obviously a teenager. You're you're getting inspired by different music. You're you're learning the piano. You're enjoying it. Give me a wee laugh. Then, do you remember what the first music album or single was that you bought with your own money, not a present <laughs> from the yeah. deal? Uh, of course, uh, you know, this is funny. It was uh, Chopin's uh, Funeral March. Um, oh, right. I, kinda, I was so like, kinda, because it's such a beautiful piece of, everyone knows the, the kind of hook kind of thing, you know, like, but it just goes in this pure, beautiful, like, like, big, like, crazy, sort of almost vibe. So the first, it was it was HMV on Argyle Street, um, across from, um, not Argyle Street, sorry, Union Street, across from uh, Central Station, which isn't there anymore. Uh, and I just wanted that that was the first uh, piece of music I ever bought myself was uh, that CD. And what about, do you remember, what was your first gig, professional concert that you went to see? Oh, well, th this, again, this, this actually happened before I played and it's probably still my best ever gig that I've been to. And it was John Martin um, at Collier's Theatre. Uh, again, it was my dad's birthday and he got tickets, uh, some of the family and I went. And uh, that was the first professional gig I went to, and it was John Martin, and he's still one of my favourites. And I went, that was magic, and I, I, I believe music is magic because it can. I mean, I always say this: it's like it's so like something that's not tangible, like music. It can make things physically happen. You can make the hairs of the back of your neck stand up. It's, it's that, that's insane that something that actually doesn't there's no tangible aspect to it can do that to you. Anyway. I, I sat there in like total awe of this show of, of John Martin and his amazing band and then the encore was John Wayne which is the, one of my favourite songs uh, and the sax player just came out and just ripped all this amazing stuff and I was just like spellbound so I was 12 I think I was when I went to see that uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't even want to play music then I was just like this is one of the greatest experiences and it, even talking about it right now I'm right back there and it still is but it's one of those ones as well, though, that you doesn't matter how good a song is, you can sit and listen to it with your, at home with your headphones on, and it, it's brilliant, but you walk into to a place and you hear it live, it, it's so different. It, it, it does some, as you say, it does something, and it's the same yeah. with music. And uh, I can remember going to my first concert and see even just, see even just, I mean, obviously I was into the rock stuff, but see even when, when the arena's still filling and you've got the guys doing the sound check and he, he's hitting the bass drum yeah. sound guy, they just just sorting the levels but you feel that hitting yeah. you right in the chest and you're like it doesn't matter how many times you've listened to anything at home you do not feel that unless you're stood right there 100% and uh, it, it, it's definitely something that, that lasts with you even to this day yeah well, uh, for sure and even like it was actually my guitarist mum said to me after one of our gigs, it was just like, you're giving people something that they can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. like, you know, like, now, you have to experience music live, like, now, to get that effect, you know, like, now, it doesn't matter how amazing an album is, but as you said, when you feel the bass drum kicking at sound check or something just happens and you're in the room, that energy, you know, it, it's maybe actually a good comment on the way life is, that, like, post-lockdown, it's like, people are missing real life a wee bit you know or what was real life of interacting with people face to face and and we need to get back to that i think we're getting there but i mean like people are working from home the city centers poor like wiped out almost i mean it's, it's like it's not this the sog hill street we used to walk up and down but it was like bouncing but now it's just like every second shop is closed it's like it's really a sad state of affairs but we need people to be out interacting and, 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 and doing things, especially going to gigs together, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've noticed that, obviously, playing playing the pubs and that. Mm -hmm. but prior to lockdown, um, I mean, through this way, I mean, you, you're talking Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, you're guaranteed 
you, you knew what place to go to for live music. It was busy. See, since, since lockdown, I mean, Friday, Saturday night, it's going to be busy. Every other night, though, it's a mm-hmm. it, mess. And, you know, there's places closed down, that there's, but they, even if the place is still open, there's no guarantee. It's definitely not as busy yeah. as it was. People, it's, you know, can't afford to come out as well. It's, it's, it's a shame, but it is getting better, but it's definitely not the way it was, yeah. you know, years ago even. But give me a wee laugh then, Mark. So you're obviously learning your instrument. Mm-hmm. What was the first band that you ever started and how did you actually start it? Um, I mean, maybe the first band was... I went to uh, North Glasgow College before I went to Stowe College. Uh, right. So maybe I was just put in a band. I mean, there was... Yeah, the school that wasn't really... I wrote a song at school, like my first song I ever wrote, but... This was that kind of project that, we, that my teacher kind of put us forward for, and we got taken down to Riverside Studios and got to yeah. record it and play at the Archies, you know, but that was just like one song. But in terms of my first band, it probably was at North Glasgow College, and it probably was the worst band in history of music, you know, as well. So it was it was terrible, it was so bad, um, and I can laugh about it. And the guitarist, uh, Jamie, uh, who I bump into every now and then, Jamie Gilmore, we still just laugh about it. It's just like, that was literally the worst band that ever existed but it was it was great i mean we gigged all the time it was it was it was just fun you know so see i know that you're obviously you're, the main band for yourself at the moment's mm-hmm. federation of the disco pimp mm-hmm. i know have you got a second band yeah i mean actually i've got mama terror which is maybe my first band just now well mama terror and federation of disco pimp are definitely like there Joint. together yeah they're, they're both doing pretty good right now uh, and I also have Kefala uh, as well, which um, was, was, was more songs basically. So Federation is more like funk, like soul, and um, mm-hmm. actually kind of more funk rock stuff. Um, Mama Terra is like jazz, soul, spiritual stuff. And Kefala is more songs, like in Bowie, Talking Heads vibe, you know. So like, kind of, so they're my three projects for sure. But Mama Terra and Federation are active and doing pretty good just now. I, di- I didn't realise Kefala was still on the go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still there. We've done two albums, like, um, but where it is just now is we're actually just building that name up because your ambition's always bigger than wh- where you are, right? You know, so, like, kind of, with, with the two... Like, it's funny, we did the first album, we did a Kickstarter for that, we got that out, and then we did the big launch night in January 2020, and it was like, wow, this is incredible, here we go. And it, like, I put the Federation to the side, Mama Terra didn't exist at that point. And it, it hit hard, it was great. And then two months later, lockdown happened. So then I wrote another Kefal album during lockdown, recorded that, came out of lockdown, uh, put that on. But that was like a big, like, these are like 10, 12 piece bands. So, um, and, and it was great, it was good turnouts, like great turnouts actually, but then, I, since then we get put on support slots um, for like touring like big guys like uh, Fantastic Negretto and uh, 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 who else did we do uh, uh, I can't remember sorry but like uh, yeah it's just, so we're just kind of and it's great just to be put in like support and it was just me and the singer you know like now so stripped right back and uh, ironically it's probably for the best because their songs and all the bells and whistles are away and uh, Warren Treaty, sorry, that was other band, Warren Treaty, that we just did. Um, uh, so it was just nice to strip it down and hear the songs, they get the lyrics and, and the vocals across, you know. So so that's kind of simmering away there, and we're just we're doing support acts slots, you know, uh, just now uh, for any those kind of gigs. So that, that, that's been nice. And especially all my bands have always been minimum seven-piece bands, and it's a lot of work to get seven yeah. people and anything, doing anything. So the, the other nice thing about the Kefala just now is it's just me and the singer. We can rock up, sound check, plug in, boom, like sit down, chill for a bit and then do the set, you know? So, it's... so would I be right in saying Federation is the one that's been going for the longest? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Fed- Federation definitely was, it kind of started just after uni um, and we were just like a, like a jam band then, just playing all our favourite old funk and, and soul so- songs. But I've always written music through the day I started playing music actually. So, um, so I just started writing uh, for the band at that point, and then, yeah. Uh, so then I would say, kind of took it seriously about 2009, maybe 2010, when I just decided to go for it with the band. 
Uh, so and it did. It was it, it was doing really well for a, a bit. Um, and now, <laughs> well, yeah. is it still the original lineup? Well, it's de- it's me, Ross on bass, and Mikey, a uh, guitarist. Uh, we were an original band. Uh, Ross, the original drummer, uh, he le- he went and did he he got show, uh, the touring shows like Dirty Dancing and Grease and stuff like that. He was like a pit player, so he left and, and did that. But he's just came back and recorded. He lives in London. He's just uh, recorded the new album, the new Federation album. So it was great right. to get him back to uh, play kit because he this will be our third album, but this is the first one he's played the full album because the first album we did a few tracks and then he, he left so this was amazing to get him from start to finish uh, and actually we're, we're heading off uh, to South by South West next week and uh, and he's coming out him and Ross the bass player are coming out to do that and that's for Mama Terra Is, the, is Federation is it purely instrumental? It, it was but um, like the first album was pretty much instrumental the second album I started introducing a few songs because the second album was, uh, uh, yeah, it was all about when the referendum hit for Scotland and stuff like that. So uh, I started like just, just not directly, but just started talking about it through song kind of thing, you know. Like, um, and then this album, this album's went kind of more like I don't know, you know, like George Clinton funkadelic kind of thing, like funk rock kind of thing. So this, this is kind of more like kind of escapism, funk rock, like psychedelia vibe, you know, so, that, but this one's got a bunch of songs in it, you know, like, kind of, uh, but again, with funk and stuff anyway, there's like, there's always chants in, in a lot of the songs as well, but, uh, yeah, so there's more songs in this album than there's ever been in any other albums. So, see, thinking about band dynamics, Yeah. in your opinion, don't, I don't mean a, a dictatorship, but does a band need a leader? The band needs a dictator when it's a big band, <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah, you need, to, when, when, when it's a, when it's a big band, maybe, maybe if it's like a four piece band, there can be some kind of, like, uh, co-op kind of thing, you know, like now the, like, it will have a, a, obviously an equal say, but when there's seven people in a band, you need a leader and you need somebody just to have a, a, a direction and a goal. Um, someone, someone to steer the ship, someone to take charge. Now, I'm, I'm not meaning you're, you're standing over everyone's shoulder saying, yeah the drummer you play this the guitarist you play that now i'm assuming everybody is capable of handling their instrument they do not need you to say play this play this but they need someone is it yourself would you say as the leader as in you're steering it let's try this let's try that yeah 100 percent. i mean i write all the music arrange all the music for the most part as well like you know and and again like I, i started especially Federation is more of a, a band you know and like as I say me, Ross and Mikey are the core members and now that's now but oh if you're in my band that's the band you know what I mean like now now everyone's got a say in that respect but in terms of like writing music now it's it's, pretty, it's just me who'll write the music kind of thing uh, I'll arrange it like now uh, I'll send the drummer like like I would never write a drum part maybe, maybe sometimes I'd say like, I, I want this but I'd, I'd, I'd probably rather send them a couple of songs saying listen that this is the kind of idea I want on this but I write like, all the riffs for like the guitars and basses like you know uh, all the horn lines I write all the lyrics you know like now uh, so like I'm very specific what I know I mean I'm, as I said I'm a huge Zappa fan and Zappa was very much like that as well he, he's just like can I so I can I take it from that only, only because and, and it's taken a long time to get to that point of like just accepting that's what it is you know and uh, but the great thing about music is there's always going to be a section where everyone can express themselves and like now ultimately now Mikey's a better guitarist than I am Ross a better bass player than I'll ever be you know that kind of vibe so of course I'll, I'll always interact with him and say that, how does that feel does that sound natural blah 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 so but I'm asking opinions because I res- love and respect these guys but I know what I want as well you know so um, um, so, and, and so I, I mean I'm, I'm guessing probably most musicians have a bit of an ego mm. right but I'm guessing it's you know, as you say, everybody gets their moment to shine. Mm-hmm. Everybody's contributing to the song to make the overall song better. But if you're leading it, the others trust you yeah. to lead the trip. You need you need to lead by example. So first and foremost, you need to respect the song. You know, it doesn't matter if it's instrumental or not. Like, so the joke, especially with Federation, is would they actually do in the band on stage? Because like it might be my band and I write the music, blah blah blah. blah but 
I'm the keyboard player in a funk band and the keyboard isn't the most important instrument in a funk, a funk band in, arguably in, in most bands it isn't so I, I play what's needed so I'm not taking every solo and every tune uh, even though I can play like anyone else in the band can play but I'm like no I give everybody their chance I, I'm the one with the least solos or like the least like heavy parts because everyone has to be getting something from it as well like as far as I'm concerned it's my world you know it's like I'm creating this this, this music, this canvas, and that's good enough for me, you know, like, and I, and I love taking a solo uh, as much as anyone else, but, like, you need to lead by example and say, I respect the song, I'll put it, play what's needed, and if, if, I think if you if you lead like that, if, if in anything, if, if you play music with honesty and integrity, then nobody can call you out on it, you know, it's just like, well, I'm just doing what's best for the song, and I believe in this, and really there's no comeback to that at all, do you know I mean? If that's how you, you, if you do it, you know? And that, that's what kind of squashes egos and, and, and things with, with people as well. It's just like, well, look what I'm doing, look what I can do, and this is what I choose to do. So you come with me or you don't kind of thing, you know, it, it gets to that point. It's amazing. I was watching, obviously, various um, videos of yourselves playing, like earlier today, right. uh, on YouTube now. It's just such a different approach so for example you, you know what you know i originally started it was all like rock heavy metal and it, it's such a different approach as in um for that type of music it's very very much guitar riff based mm -hmm. right the, the guitar riff is is basically leading the song and you've got the guitar and the drums the bass is almost not all the time but I don't want to say non-existent, but it fills in the bottom end. But you know, the main things the guitar and the drums, and it's almost like the vocals are, are, are like an afterthought. Like we need to put some singing here because we're not an instrumental band. But the main things the the guitar riff, and, I, and I'm listening to Federation earlier, and you, I mean, your your bass player and your drummer are just linked in so perfectly, creating. The foundation for everybody else that I mean I could sit and probably listen just to the two of them by themselves yeah. they, they, were, they were linked in so well and your guitarist has got this ability he, he jumped between rhythm and lead so he'll, he'll be contributing lead and almost link in with your bass player and drummer but he has his wee opportunity to if, if it's a guitar so you know They've created this foundation that you can just float along the top and play whatever he's wanting. You've got your horn section, which is kind of just jumping in now and again. It's almost playing like a wee counter melody to everything. And then it just leaves you just to, on top to control the whole thing, do whatever it is you want to do. It, it's, it's fascinating to actually watch because it's such a different approach from yeah. what, what I'm used to. But then, funnily enough, in the last couple of years, Actually, having doing doing the pub gigs, I've switched over to acoustic guitar. Mm. None of it at all is guitar riff based. It's all vocal melody. Sure. So again, that that's a completely different sure. approach from what I'm used to. So you've got the rock stuff that's guitar based, riff based. The stuff I'm doing now, there is no guitar riffs. You've got yeah, some so. chords, and it's all to do with your vocals. Yeah. And that's so it, it's it's different for every type of music. But mm. it was fascinating to watch. Cool. Uh, because it's just so different and obviously it helps that the guys are all extremely accomplished players mm. I mean they know what they're doing they can read each other perfectly mm. probably having played a million gigs together and practices and stuff like that but it is fascinating to watch but I was going to ask you about obviously songwriting you've kind of said it's yourself that comes up with the original ideas and so are you coming up with the ideas and allowing everyone just to contribute and basically building the song to the point that you think right that's it that's it done well i mean not really like, i kind of come in with a, a, a pretty solid idea of what it is you know like now even in the last few years i demo a lot of it now you know like now can i and um so i'm given i'd say i'm giving it at least 80 percent done you know like now can i um so again the respect i have for like ross and mike and, and the whole band obviously but like so like I'll, I'll write the lines and stuff like that, the guitar lines, the the bass lines uh, for the most part. But then there, there'll be sections where it's like, well, this is just a this is a solo, so that we can open up a bit here and go for it, you know. So, but I, I'm very I'm very specific what I want, you know. So, like, uh, it's funny that you say that because 
Oh, I was going to ask you, see, when I mean, you're playing gigs, mm -hmm. it sounds extremely loose. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, it, do you, when you are playing the songs live, mm -hmm. do they get played the same way at every single gig? For example, your guitarist goes into a, a guitar solo. Mm -hmm. Will he get the same solo each time you do a gig? Or does he know, right, I've got the next 16 bars to do this solo, and is, are you... Is he just improvising on the spot, or is that a bit of both? It's a bit of both. I think I think every solo is really, if they're honest with themselves, well, if they if they if they've soloed something they really like, they're going to keep it, right? You so so maybe that's an inspiration. But so like that's that even a, a jump off point, they'll start it like yeah. like that way, and then yeah, I mean it's it's, more, it's obviously improvised, but yeah, there'll definitely be a wee hook or a couple of bars where they know what they're doing, kind of thing. So. I mean, I actually find more for myself when I'm soloing, I have to kind of stick to what I, like, like what I've done in a lot of ways. I still, I still mess up a little bit, but not as much as everyone else because I'm leading the band as well, and then I'm trying to cue the band coming out when I'm soloing as well, you know. So, um, so I, I, I'm trying to let it. There's, there's sections that this is what kind of keeps it fresh. Hopefully for the listener, it's like there's sections that are so rigid and they have to be that way, and there'll be sections where I'll, I'll let it go. But that keeps the band in the toes as well because. If it was the same thing every night, then everyone would be bored as well. So it's that balance. Do, do you um, do you get nervous before a gig? And what I don't mean, mm. I mean there are different types yep. of being nervous. I don't, I don't mean thrown up in a bucket and yep. you know, on stage. Or is it more a nervous as in I want to go there and do it? Or does it just are you quite chilled out? I mean, like up till a few years ago. I've, I don't think I was ever nervous. I never thought about it. Like it's just it's like grieving, you know. Like now, but it was when I started writing songs like the Kefala, and I was going on stage going, like e even though the Kefala band was mostly the Federation like ba bands, you know, like it was like, a few different people. But f again, the core, I always Ross and Mikey and all my bands in that respect, you know. Like and I, I, I'd surround myself because I just love them. I think they're the best, you know. So why would I not use them as much as possible? Uh, but. It was funny enough, I was walking on stage for that gig and I was like, oh God, people are actually going to hear my lyrics like now coming, even though I wasn't even singing them, you know, like now I'd, I'd sing us, but I was like, obviously everything's open to interpretation, but especially with lyrics, it's as direct as you can be, I suppose, as a, like now as a songwriter of, of, of uh, stating what you mean. So I was like, oh my God, I'm, some of it was super personal, some of it was very political, some of it was just thoughts in my head, like, but even it didn't matter, it was like, I, I'm I'm here watching the audience react to my lyrics because there's all, especially the Federation. There's such a bravado with it. They're all great musicians. It's all high energy. And it's just like here's a party. You're, now we're having a party. You want to join it? Then great. If you don't, we're, we're still going to party. So that was always that's always the Federation vibe. But with Kefala, it was songs, and I was just like, and, and, and songwriting was a, a really new thing at that point for me. Um, so that was the first time I was like, oh, I, I felt I was going on stage. To like lay my soul bare, you know, in that respect, and then yeah. even more so when we started doing those strip back gigs, because we didn't have all of those musicians as well. It was just me on the piano and Alex singing. So that was so the Kefala project was definitely when I started feeling it again, going on stage, and it was great because they all feed in each other, they all inspired each other, like to to push on to different things as well. So yeah, that was the first time in my life. See your your lyrics, mm -hmm. right? If I was, to, if you were to go and write them down, and I was just to read them without hearing any of the music, would it be obvious what song one is about? As it, or is it? You know, for example, there'll be some people, you know, Jim Morrison. Let, let's yep. use him for example. You go and ask ten people, what, what, what do you think he's meaning? You probably get ten different answers. Yep. You go and ask somebody about Johnny Cash. It's pretty obvious what he's talking about. He's telling a story. Yep. Are your lyrics pretty obvious? Well, the fuck you for album. They're pretty obvious. The second one is definitely vague, and it's and but that actually, when when I write an album, I always have a, a concept. It's always a concept album in that respect, where like I'll come up with a title track for every album first, and then that, yep. that leads it. So the first couple albums called Cowboys and Africans, and yep. that's obviously a play on like Cowboys and Indians, and it's it's more about when they say like yeah, dodgy plumber or a dodgy whatever he's a cowboy right so and this was when Trump was in power and stuff as well so they're the cowboys and and Africans is as I explained in the, in the notes of the album it's like all humans come from Africa at one point so 
every good person is African in that respect. So that's so the whole album is about how we're being controlled and like now kind of like now and every step and and every song like is a jumping off point from from different points of view. Um, uh, but then the march into forever, the second album, is mm-hmm. about life and death, and it's about we have no control of anything, but that's okay because once. Like life is there before you're born, it's there when we're here, and it's there when we're gone. So we have no control of that. So every song on that album is about not being in control. One's about a relationship. One's about just like 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 my daughter being sad when my when our, uh, our, our great nana passed and stuff. So and 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 how we deal with this thing. And and, and then there's a song um, about but uh, I use the Bowie t- uh, technique of like that you just take lyrics and you just because. The whole the concept of the album is there's no control. So one of the songs mm-hmm. had to be I have no control of the song in that respect. So it's called okay. uh, Keep Moving. So I just basically what I did was every year, like my my birthday, I just went on, online. I got the newspaper from different parts of the world. I, I downloaded them and I took some words from like all these newspapers, wrote them down, chopped them up into little bits that were buried. I put them on the floor, grabbed certain words, and then I had to make lyrics from it so that the song wrote wrote it so I had no control of it so so that that song for sure is so vague like now people could 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 tell you what it's about you know so like so yeah so the first album was very much this is what I'm saying the second album is like well what do you think so see having done both yeah do you prefer recording or do you prefer gigging <laughs> oh man these are such good questions because up to I made my first proper album, I was I would always consider myself a live musician, like about gigging live and putting on a show and a performance. Yeah. But when when I made my first album, uh, we I still went over to New York to mix it, and and that changed everything. I met this producer Joe Hamlin, and he changed the way I even thought about music. You know, so so then I started writing for the studio for space. I created so much more space because I wanted to hear the production and, and the sound of it like that. So then. Right up till just post lockdown, just just there, I would always say I was I, would, I preferred the studio, but now I'm getting out gigging again with all my bands, and it's incredible because just again, just what we started with as well, or maybe it was even before we started this, like talking about being around people again and just that that audience interaction. So I feel really lucky that cause I was a class as a producer now as well. Uh, like I can do both, and I love it's- both. Like you, you do love both, but you get something different out of well, each one. A hundred percent. It's different. It's different disciplines. A hundred percent. And I, I've learned to use the studio as an instrument now as well, with it being a cliche. And um, but, but the, the thing with that is because obviously there's there's definitely a control freak like running through me a wee bit here as well. Yeah. So in the studio, when everybody's done their parts, then like I can sit and Ross, my bass player, he's he's my engineer as well, co-producer. So like. We can just sit and just carve like sounds and, and, and just do what we want. So like now, that, that that's really that's really fun, you know. Like kind of, but then live, like playing with these amazing musicians, you can interact and bounce off them, and, and you can't get that in the studio. And how how important do you think it is to to have a good producer? Because I think it's one of those things that's probably overlooked. But yeah. as most people probably, you hear bands talking, they always view them as the extra member of the band oh 100% as I said like when I met Joel we mm-hmm. we, we, um, we got in t- touch with Joel because there was this funk band in New York that we loved and we went we only had we only did this double A side and we said if we could if we were signed and we had all the money who would we get to produce it and it would be Joel Hamlin so Ross reached out to Joel just to do these two tracks online just sent them over via the web he mixed them sent them back and it that, that was incredible. So then we went over, finished the album, and me, Ross, and Mikey went and just sat there for five days while he mixed it. We never really said anything. He's he did all the talking, he did all the mixing, and um, and in those five days, I learned more about music than I did four years at uni and two years at college, like hands down. And um, and then he did the, the next album, the next Federation album. I took the whole band over. We recorded it start to finish over there. And it was like, and I've, every time I can get over to America, I, I would hang out with Joe and learn from him because the producer is just, is just, it's integral. It's actually integral to making an album. And you need to be able to trust your producer. If you don't trust your producer, because there's a lot of things I didn't agree with what he's doing, but I'm like, well, this guy's nominated for like 
like at the time of six Grammys, he's like up to nine now, like, can I, like, can I, I was like, I need to trust him, who am I, like, we're paying him money, why are we paying him money if we don't trust him, you know, let him, let him do his thing, so, uh, again, I did relinquish that control, but it was very, it was quite easy because I trusted him and I loved what he did and the sounds that he made, so I've had to self-produce my last four albums now, purely, like, like financial reasons, but I feel like, by, by no means I would say I'm a top producer by any means, but, I know what I want and I know how to get it, uh, especially with Ross, you know, like side by side. So, like, um, over here, there's no doubt else I'd want to do it, like, now trust. So, if I could go back and do it with Joe all the time, I would. And there's some other producers obviously I'd love to work with as well, but it's only because I can't afford, like, now to do it. I have, I've had to produce the last few albums myself, but I know what I want. As I said, like, now that's why even to the parts, to the sound and stuff like now, I can I can I can get there. But I'm always I'm never totally happy obviously. I'm always trying to get better at everything. Um but a producer that you trust and believe in is 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 as important as anybody, arguably more than a lot of the musicians in the band. And how how do you record uh, in the studio? So for example, mm-hmm. there's a lot of bands I think you probably already know the answer to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there's a lot of bands that will the drummer will lay it down first <clears throat> and then they'll build on it you know bass guitars you know it's all kind of getting layered up on it yeah. or you've got the other option of maybe either everybody going in and doing it live or maybe a section of it doing it live and then doing overdubs how do you go about recording um well it's definitely nothing's ever done full band live because there's always going to be overdubs and stuff like that you know but like the way the last few albums have went is I've actually demoed the whole album myself in the house first so that becomes like a, almost a, a a fancy guide track a, a click track you know so then yeah. what we'll do is in the studio we'll take away the drums and the bass and the like, there's no real guitars really apart from riffs I would, I would say so so then we would go in as a rhythm section and records to the, the guide vocals and the guide, maybe some keys or whatever. So we'll, we'll do it that way. And then, so my point is, there's nobody really good in themselves, maybe apart from the, 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 the lead vocals at, at, at the end, you know, for the, the for real take. But for the most part, there's always at least two or three musicians recording at any one time. And I just think, again, it's a producer move. It's just like, if you're just doing it yourself, then you can go, right, fine, if I mess up, I'll take another take. But if you know two other guys, like the horns hate me for this, but the horns never record solo. Like now, there's always, there's always a section for the horns. So if one guy makes a mistake, then they all have to do it again. You know what I mean? So, and it's like, well, you're a section. You need to do it together. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, so you do it for the team. Now, don't be selfish, like blah, 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 you know, kind of thing. So, uh, I suppose there's also like this. There is an energy. Yeah, that- it's a performance. It's more of a performance when you do it like that, for sure. And you don't want to get that lost by yeah. doing it. Yeah, absolutely. But here's a here's a good question for you, right? So we're the same age. Going back, right, when we were really young, um, when we were buying albums, buying music, right? Mm-hmm. I know for me, there's times where I would go into a music shop and I would buy an album simply based on the artwork, on the album cover. Didn't know what the song sounded like. I mean, it was... It was a sort of guess, almost, yeah. right? And then you fast forward all the all these years. Is artwork still important? Because the way that music is accessed nowadays by streaming, by downloading, there's a whole generation of people younger than ourselves that they would almost think, well, why do you need artwork? Mm-hmm. Like, why is it even relevant? Is artwork still relevant, do you think? To me, it is. Uh, and I, I can testify that because Gordon Beveridge, who is my arts director, he has done every one of my albums, and he is again a member of the band. You know, like kind of he uh, he get he digests the album. Uh, he will he'll, he'll just like we'll sit we'll chat about it. But first and foremost, I've sent him as finished as I'll give him. You know, like kind of maybe maybe just before master. So he gets an idea, but I'll send them like if it's like a fall stuff. I'll send them lyrics first, or if it's federation, yep. send them tracks. But he always gets it, and there's not much like changing once he's came up with his concept because he really is so attentive and sensitive to the music. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and this is because, and this means so much to me because same with vinyl. Like all my albums, part of one is on vinyl um, yeah. because it's so tangible and the artwork. You know, like you pick it up and you see it there. It's, it means something to you. It meant something to me when I was a kid. You know, so it's it's, it's so you, important. You know, if you, were, if you were to ask like somebody younger, like say somebody that's twenty twenty one, yeah. I, I don't think they would appreciate like. Um, you creating something from nothing, yeah. and then one day you're actually holding it yeah. in your hands, and you go, "I've created this," and you've created everything. You've created, you've had your part in the artwork, the track order. You know, you've not, you've not just wrote ten songs and sit, and just put the ten out. It's got to start on this song. It's got to lead into this one. Yeah. You've got to have this one fourth or fifth. You've got to definitely end with this song. I mean, stuff like that is important, and it's such a shame because I feel like. I think it's really important, but it is getting lost. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm always surprised though that you're still getting these amazing, accomplished musicians so young. You know, because you're like everyone's like TikTok or Instagram, and it's seven seconds, it's reels. It's like kind of like now people's attention spans are so gone. It's it's like an advert. If you're not caught by five seconds, then they've skipped your track and stuff like that. But what what gives me hope is that you've seen all these really accomplished, amazing level musicians still coming through. So I think, yeah, I think it is lost in a lot of ways. But I still think there is a core there that what do appreciate it, and they need to just do their part and uh, keep pushing it as well, and keep yeah. talking about how important the artwork is or the producer is and stuff like that as well. I mean, personally, I think th th there is still great music coming out, there's great musicians, there's great bands, you just need to know where to look to yeah. find them and I mean if you're if you're relying on something as simple as the radio or the television, you're not going to find it. But I mean it's the problem is that's extrapolated because of algorithms because like if you go on Spotify and you play an album and then they're just going to suggest an album similar to it, like they're, di they're dictating like a radio or a TV like the playlist they're dictating what you're listening to, you know. So that that's a shame as well because it's it's more targeted than than radio. I'd say because radio has to be more eclectic. And Spotify, I'd say, if you're listening to classic rock, they're going to give you a classic rock thing. But like w where we would say, like you like, I don't know, say you like like uh, Cat Stevens, and then the next album comes up as Yes. You're like, why would why are you listening to Yes after Cat Stevens as well? The the connection is Rick Wakeman. Keyboard player played on oh, Modern is Broken and then was a keyboard player for Yes and stuff like that. So two very different genre like, styles of genre. Like now, but you think that's the beauty of magic when you've got the notes and you go, Oh, who's a keyboard player? He's amazing, or who's a guitarist? You know, like now kind of then that'll take you on to different genres where algorithms will kind of stick to the same genre, you know. So and radio, I suppose radio shows can be broad but in a good way sometimes because they have to play to like a, a wider audience, you know. So like it's maybe not a bad thing and I would say that's a, like what is it it's just maybe the internet in general it's amazing for people like us who knew what it was like before, before the internet so we appreciate that you can get anything at, at your fingertip because we know how hard we had to work to find all these gems uh, but people who have like generations of of grew up with the internet do not appreciate like how hard it was to get anything or even to hear it or even to watch an episode of something you had to wait a week you know like now for the next one you know so it, all, all my point is all this stuff was earned you know like now can we earned it like we had to save up money for an album like music is now worthless in the sense of like now uh, like value wise uh, because it's, you can get Spotify for free with an advert you know so every piece of amazing music ever existed pretty much is on Spotify and you don't have to earn that anymore you know it, it's ridiculous you know like now it's devalued in a lot of ways it's a strange one because there's no denying technology is brilliant, mm -hmm. but it has has it made things better? I'm not sure because you you would have been the same as me growing up, you know, mm. didn't didn't have a lot of money or anything like that, and so it would be that thing in in your bedroom you would have, you'd save your pocket money up, you would buy, you know, an album every month or whatever it was, and you know, say you had. 15 albums in your room you knew those albums inside out start because you didn't have unlimited choice you had those 15 albums to listen to mm -hmm. so 
you, 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 it's almost like you studied them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and now, it's crazy because you could sit and listen to bands from all over the world that previously you would never have heard of, but the choice is so much, it's almost like it gets lost, like you can't decide on what to listen to. It's a wee bit like with television, you know, where, you know, back when we were younger, you had four channels, but you always found something to watch. Mm-hmm. Now you have 300 channels, you can't find anything. 100% right. And, and even the, the music thing as well, it's like Stevie Wonder Songs in the Key Life is one of my favourite albums. And I've still got my uh, first copy of it. I bought on CD, double CD from yeah. HMV and it was 23 99 for a double CD and that was a lot of money. I had to save up for that. And then yeah. there's songs on that I didn't like, but as you said, because because you've earned that, you've, you've, now, you want to get your money's worth. So, yeah. like, the songs that I didn't like at first are now my favourite songs on that album. Do you know, like, because... You want, as you said, if you only had fifteen albums in your room, or you only had like two albums, you know, like it doesn't matter. You're going to know that inside out because you've spent all your money on it, you know. So it's it's earned, and you want to take everything from that you can. Where now, as I said, you can go on Spotify, and any amazing album is available for free on some platform, you know. So it's like, so how how do you value that, you know? Like when you can literally just throw it away because I can. It's always there if I want it, you know. Where before it was like, wow. Where do we go from here? And how do you think music has progressed? And, and what I mean by that is, you go back years and years ago, right? In the 50s, Elvis comes along, all these other people, rock and roll is born, right? And then you've got the 60s, progresses on, you've got a lot of drugs and bits and pieces, but there's sounds being created that have never been heard before. Mm-hmm. It continues on to the 70s, you've got different styles getting created, you've got disco, you've got maybe punk towards the end, you've got what would eventually turn into heavy metal, you then go into your 80s and it it progresses on. The 80s definitely a lot more technology had progressed, so lots more synths and things like that. The 90s came around, you had a bit more of a sort of band feel again. Has music progressed, or like personally I, I always kind of feel like up into the 90s, there was new sounds being created, and from the 2000s onwards, still plenty of great music being created. There's nothing I hear nowadays that I go, I have never heard that sound before. Mm. I'll hear it and I might go, that's really good, but it sounds like this from 20 years ago. Do you think it's, it's gotten to a point where everything has been done? I don't mean that new, new, new music cannot be created that's really good. I'm just meaning, is there sounds that we've still not heard yet or do you feel like we've got to a point where that's it's pretty much everything has been done and it's just a matter of how you now present it? Um, I, I would never say that everything's been done even though we're, we're acting like it has been, you know, like cause, because we, I would say, I, I couldn't agree more with you, I'd actually say probably in mid-90s is when, even I'd say late 80s, that's when identity went out of music in that respect where, as you said, there's decades were defined by sound and, and, and now, like, you say 80s music, 70s music, 60s music, we, we knew what we're talking about, you know, but like 90s, noughties, 10s, now, it's just like, the problem, what I see from it's the same with, like film and movies, is it's a nostalgia fest. It's like we're trying to recreate sounds, you know, like the irony is we're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on gear and, and plugins to, to degrade the sounds, to make them sound like they did in the seventies or the eighties where like and that's not how they were they were trying to make the best music they could. It was just that they were limited by technology, you know, like now but now we're using technology to, to degrade the sound almost, you know. So but we're, we're, we're so sycophantic in the the nostalgia fest that it's like like it's the same with movies. When's the last time you saw a, a great new original movie in the mainstream, you know, it's like maybe one every five years if you're lucky, you know, like you know same with music, it's like there's no new, like, in the mainstream, that is, like, now music getting pushed out there because it's it's not been celebrated. The, the, like, the artist, the songwriter, is not celebrated anymore. It's, again, parallel with movies, it's like there's no movie stars anymore. You know, it's like, obviously, like, it's, it's, just, it's just actors playing, like, superheroes, basically. That's what's now, let's like, monopolise the movie. Like business and the mainstream movie business. I mean, music. It's like there's no. Where, where's your Bowies? You know, like now. Where's like where's yeah. your Benricks? You know, there's like it's 
it's just celebrating oh the nineteen seventy five sound like this or you know like the sound like this you know like and, and everyone's always been inspired by different music but like it doesn't feel like they're trying to push it feels like they're just trying to recreate rather than say well I love this let's see where we can take this now but I, I'd also say what we all do and this is I went to see um, uh, songs in the key of life with Stevie Wonder album I was talking about played live yep. by Stevie uh, about five years ago at Hyde Park. And he said, it's amazing after 40 years, this album, people still want to hear it, but it's also quite sad because of the, the themes in it are still relevant today. And then that's, again, this ties in with the Kefala project, like that. Even though I might not be seeing anything new, I can put my own spin on it, you know? So that's, what, keep, that, that's what keeps it fresh. In terms of sounds, that's a different question. And I feel like nobody's chasing sounds anymore. They're, they're looking back the way they're looking forward for the most part. It's strange when when you what you just said there because see playing playing in in the pubs. Mm -hmm. What I've found that I've seen in the last couple of years is if you you know if I'm playing a gig, I'll maybe play forty five songs. You know it's normally three hours, right? And if I play, if somebody, I mean you, you've obviously got to play pretty much the mainstream because you're entertaining just the regular pub punters, right? But if you play a song that's a big a big song just now that, that's just came out it'll have a shelf life, mm -hmm. right? So you'll play that f for six months, you'll play it for a year and it's going to go down great, you know it's going to, you know, people are going to come in, they're going to enjoy it. It then get, it's, it gets very, very tired and you've got to shelf it, mm -hmm. right? You go back and play a song that's 40 years old and it still goes down great today as it did 40 years ago. Now, I don't know if part of that is nostalgia or, I don't know, was this songwriting better back then? Or it's a, it's a strange one to think about because the other thing, that with t the way technology has, has came about, a lot of the songs that come out nowadays, it's almost like, I mean, you can be you can edit it and be absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the bands back in the day, as you as you well know, you know, they would record what is classed as a, as a classic album now. They would record that in like a month. They'd just go into the studio, they'd hook everything up, and they would record it pretty much live with minimal overdub. Now, part of the reason for that was simply they did not have the technology. Yeah, you know, the they, had, they had maybe six or eight tracks you know, that they could use. Nowadays, you've got unlimited tracks, but it's almost like you can be too perfect. Oh, and if those bands were to record nowadays, you, you could maybe argue that the sound would be better because technology is better. Would the songs actually be better? You know, maybe not. It's, it's a strange one to think about. No, no I, I mean, I would say, like, you, you create best with limitations, do you know what I mean? So, like, you know, like, so when you know you're confined by four channels or eight channels, yeah. then you have to be more creative. You know, when you've got endless channels, then you can, that's the thing, there's no, it's the commitment, you know, to the, the take, or the, if you're putting some, like if you're gonna compress it really hard, going in and stuff like that, you know, it's like, back in the day is, that was a move as you did it. So there was almost a confidence of going, well, this is, this is what it's gonna be, but now you can record it really dry. I, I do not record this at all, you know, like now, I, I colour my sounds as much as possible going in, so it's committed. You know, like now, kind of, I'm, I'm going in with a sound, uh, and and I take that. That's again with the horns playing together, the rhythm section playing together, but there's lots of spill and stuff like that. So there's there's no separation. It's like, no, this is what's going to be. You know, like now, there's no fix in the mix. This is how it's going to be. So, but interestingly enough, I fought long and hard because of, of what you're saying about old songs versus new songs. I used to be in a band called the Easy Orchestra and we were the house band on Radio Scotland for years. Every Friday we'd play two songs live in air. One would be an old song, one would be a new song. Easy. Any old song. Because basically so the band was like acoustic guitar, vocalist, congas and me and piano. So we really stripped back versions of every song we did. You strip, you strip a Beatles song or something, it was easy to do. You know, like you try and strip a, a song in the noughties or the, the tens or whatever, it was it was really hard uh, because it's so production like now heavy and, and reliant, you know. So I think people used to write songs like where now they're in the studio and there's like I mean there's that famous one where I'm not even the biggest Queen fan, but you know it's like now you, you see a Beyonce song now and it's like it's got 25 co-writers on it, 
and then like and the, and the lyrics start, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, something like that, you know. Like, and I love Beyonce. I must say, life I guess, but just an example. And then you've got uh, BB and Rhapsody written and like by Freddie Mercury. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you know, it's like it's like no, he sat and wrote a song, you know, from start to finish, and it was like where, and that's what they all did back in the day. Where that, that's I mean, even with sounds get pushed forward, it's all inspired by like the, the the song. You know, you need to serve the song. You know, so even. All, all my instrumental music has the stories behind every song, you know, like now I'm writing songs even for instrumental, like I, I, I treat it like that, I'm always melody first, you know, like now you're, you're prompting that up, if it's the horns or the guitars or a vocal, it doesn't matter, you have to be like serving the melody or the, the lead line, you know, so and I think that's what's getting lost where you're just kind of like painting over it all with, with effects and stuff. <laughs> Maybe the reason why you're writing it. So, for example, th that example you just used there with Freddie Mercury, right? Now, you can. It's hard to see it, say it now because it's obviously one of the most well-known songs, and it certainly turned out well. But when he was writing that, he had a, a vision, something in his head that this is what I want, mm -hmm. and he wasn't doing it because I'm going to make a lot of money from this. Yeah. He didn't even know if it was going to work, if it was going to be possible yeah. to record it. Whereas you flip that over, that you you've got six or seven songwriters around the table mm. trying to write a song because they they need to write this number one song to make the money from it. Yeah. I suppose maybe that that's a, an argument, but that, that's it. And the, the other thing I'd say about like in defence of new music is the market share was a lot higher, like because yeah. as you said there was only one radio station or two radio stations and or one TV show, so like like you had to listen to that one song over and over. Now yeah. you've got every like device can give you a million different like like options. But I mean, it's it's like music. The music industry is a great leveler nowadays. If you're just starting out, you know. But something like myself who's been in it a long time. It's like well, where am I left when, like, it's like I've I've paid my dues in a lot of ways. I'm still paying my dues and all that. But like now I've got a level platform with like a kid at twelve. You know, like they can get on Spotify yeah. like I can. You know what I mean? Or, or, or whatever Apple Music, so it's like, uh, and then that's good in certain ways, but then it's like, well, how are you, how are you, and then it just cancels each other out because, as you said earlier on, where do you start? You know, when everything's available to you, you know, now where do you look? Now somebody has to guide you, you know, and and it can't be on like AI algorithms because they they might be smart once you've listened to one thing, but like they're not really. It's, it, the suggestion never comes from the heart and the soul, you know, like where we would, you know, where. You're like Marco, listen to this track, or I'll say you can check this out, you know, because I just love this track and there's no reason why you like it apart from that I like it. Algorithms yeah. don't work like that, it's like based on what you like, this is what you should listen to, you know. So, Mark, we're, we're, we're early on in 2024. So what is your plans for the rest of the year with regard to music? What have you got planned? Well, I'm just heading out to Austin um, to do South by Southwest um, mm -hmm. next week, and then I'm going to. Germany to do jazz ahead. So this is both with Mama Terra, my jazz band. Yep. Um, uh, hopefully, I have a bunch of shows booked, but I, I just want to be playing music. I've been like recording and releasing a lot of music in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I really want to be playing. Uh, so um, that will be the most part. But the new Federation album is done f uh, for all intents and purposes. So that should be coming out at the end of the year, if not the start of next year. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening right now. Cool. And just to end it, we've got a couple of fun questions because we've been super serious. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> right, so, some fun questions. You ready for this? Oh. Right, so imagine you've got a time machine. Okay. Right, a, a lovely DeLorean, mm -hmm. right? And you can go back in time to attend mm -hmm. any one gig. Oh. What would the concert, whether it be a big concert, a small concert, what would be the one gig if you could go back in time that you would love to have checked out? Mm. Well, I'd love to have seen like Zappa play yeah. in uh, the Live in New York, 1977 is one of my favourite live albums. Uh, so, and like the Brecker Bros and that, Terry Bozio and Kat, Ray, Ike Willis, Ray Brown, like, that would be a show to see. That or a Miles Davis gig, for sure. Mm. And uh, obviously you're a, you're a piano man. Mm -hmm. If you weren't playing piano, what's another instrument you wish that you could actually play? Cello. Cello is like my second favourite instrument. So yeah. 
It's just fancy, and <laughs> I'm not fancy, so <laughs> I'd like to be a bit fancy. <laughs> the other question is for you as well, then. If you could either record or jam with any musician or mm-hmm. band, dead or alive, who who would it be? Or who would they be, sorry? Uh, probably like, like Mr. James. Zappa. Sorry? Mr. Zappa? Z- yeah. Do you know what? I think to, to be with Zappa and one of those, that, 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 that kind of early 70s to late 70s period would any his incarnations and mothers or whatever or the bands after that would just be I don't know if I'd, be, I'd get into it but if I could sneak in in, in that session I'd love to do that and then very last question for you Mount Rushmore who is the top <laughs> four whether it be musicians or who are the top four you know whether it's songwriting whether it's the ability to play live, whether it's overall package, who's the top four on your list for you mm. there? But for musicians? Musicians or bands? Mm. On Mount Rushmore, right? Uh, Miles Davis, Zappa, is it four? Um, uh, who else would it be? Uh, God, it's such a hard question because th- I know those two for sure, but then Everybody else changes, right? You know what I mean? So, uh, Bill I mean, Withers, maybe? You Bill Withers. can't even pick me, because that's, that's just too old. There's a goal excluded, of course. Uh, oh, man. I've got three. Uh, oh, James Brown. I'm just going to put him up there. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, it's been great speaking to you. Ian, it's been a total pleasure. It's been great to Far too long. Up. I'll need, need to get myself along to a gig. And see, uh, I think the last time I came along was probably at least 15 years ago. No, no. <laughs> but uh, I'll need to get myself along. But thanks for coming on. It's been appreciated. No, um, not at all. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, interesting hearing your, your mind come up with <laughs> crazy answers. But no, uh, until sorry. next time, <laughs> I'll see you again, all right? Thanks, Ian. Cheers, man. All right. Cheers, pal. All right. See you later.